Hi, I'm Esteban Kelly, Executive Director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, and we are here in Buffalo for Common Bound 2016. I'm talking with uh, Crystal Cornelius from the First Nation Oista Corporation. And um, my first question for you is, if you could tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Wonderful, so um, First Nations Oista Corporation is a certified native CDFI, and we are the only intermediary lender in the nation that specifically serves native CDFIs throughout the country. Mm. So what that means is, um, we are essentially non-regulated banking institutions mm -hmm. that serve the underserved. So our organization provides capital to all of the 70 native CDFIs, so so we can propel reservation economies to bolster asset building in terms of home ownership, entrepreneurship, mm. private sector economy, as well as consumer lending. For um, generation upon generation, Native communities have lived in cash economies. Mm -hmm. We have not had the accessibility to conventional banking institutions mm -hmm. um, for a myriad of reasons. I would say the the yeah, most. Yeah, tell us about some of those. Some yeah, of those reasons. Yeah. In so, your founding. so one of the um, major reasons is the location of reservation throughout the United States. Mm. In my um, language, reservation, um, it equates to a shkunigan, mm -hmm. which literally means leftovers. That's mm. the English translation. So when you look at a majority of the 566 federally recognized tribes, we're all in extremely, extremely remote areas. Mm -hmm. um, areas that the federal government deemed at the time <clears throat> was not good for agricultural type of purposes, um, you know, timber, whatever type of resources. So we would somewhat be put on the outskirts. That mm -hmm. being the case, we're still residing there today. Mm -hmm. Most of our tribal members, or, or, or some I would say, um, about half throughout the United States, we have to drive over 100 miles to get to a bank. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. So with that, we find that economies really stagnate within private sector development. Mm -hmm. Tribes in and of itself are able to accommodate um, basic living um, type of, of services per se, but don't have enough resources to really propel economies in, in different measures. So what our organizations do, Native CDFIs throughout Indian country, is we provide that essential capital in conjunction with mm -hmm. education. So you cannot get a loan unless you take education. Mm -hmm. um, and we are finding extreme um, rises within um, entrepreneurship, homeowners, or um, even financial literacy in mm -hmm. and of itself is something that we provide. Being, again, as I, I previously indicated, living in cash economies, we haven't really had to manage cash. So when it comes to a point mm -hmm. that we want to buy a home, buy a car, we understand, goodness, we have no credit. We didn't know right. that credit card would yeah. do this. And now where do we go? There's nowhere to go. So CDFIs really provide that outlet to build mm -hmm. community members up and to build private sector development. And are you federally regulated? Is how much of this is is um, relates to issues of sovereignty regulation? How does that work? Um, it, it it really doesn't in that accord because the CDFI movement in and of itself is a special program housed under the Department of Treasury. Mm. So with that, um, there's certain certification rules that these nonprofits, which are called CDFIs, Community right. Development Financial Institutions, have to follow. We regulate ourselves in so far as our loan policies, in so far as board governance, whatever be the case. Mm. As I indicated, there's 70 CDFIs mm -hmm. native led throughout the country there's 990 mm. so we're just a very small subset of right. this movement going on that's really helped to serve the underserved whether that be minority populations urban populations there are um, probably about 30 CDFIs mm. um, in New York as mm -hmm. we speak right now to help with these issues that I'm talking about sure. not necessarily dealing with rural communities but with underserved populations within each and every state so this relates to redlining as well? It, it, it does in an effect that we are banking and we are, are not necessarily banking. We're non-depository institutions, so I, I digress there. Um, we're serving the individuals that the banks would never serve anyway. So right. redlining as far as that as that would mm -hmm. go, um, even though that's illegal as of the 60s, we know that it still somewhat does happen within mm -hmm. certain areas. So these institutions really are meant to combat those type mm -hmm. of historical practices and break that institutional barrier down to mm -hmm. help each and every person attain whatever they dream to attain mm -hmm. and have the resources and education to help them with that. And of the 70 or so CDFIs um, that you mentioned, 
were they mostly started around the same time or how how did those those efforts get no underway? so so what happened within the cdfi fund itself um in 1990, the Congress mandated that there is a study of Indian country. And so what that study, um, in 2001, the Native American Lending Study was issued, essentially what Congress was asking, and they did um, interviews throughout Indian country for about two years. So their question was, hey, we're giving so much money to, to Native tribes. Why are they still in perpetual poverty? Mm. What's going on here? Why do we need, still need to keep giving these Indians money? Um, one of the main barriers they found there were 16 major barriers to economic development, but the first barrier was they have no access to capital. There is no access to pa capital. So right. there is no divestment within Indian country because nobody's invested in the first place. Right. So with that, there is a special set aside that was made for Native Americans under the CDFI fund. Mm -hmm. um, and from that time, in 1991, there was two Native CDFIs. Now we've got 70. Sure. And we see that it's growing because it's working. Mm. They're the only financial outlet most of the time within Native communities to help build tribal members' assets. Banks aren't coming in. Banks aren't putting in satellite offices. Um, a lot of, of foundation footprints, reservations are, are out of footprint. So mm -hmm. really, th these institutions in and of itself become a major hub for economic yeah. development. And is there an... Uh a lot of difference in terms of the the assets that are held by from one to one CDFI to another, or is there generally a, an average? Or no, the, what's very interesting there is um, fundraising ability. Um, number one, we have some native CDFIs. Um, for instance, Citizen Potawatomi CDC in Oklahoma, they have about a twenty million dollar portfolio. Hmm. They're about a thirty million dollar organization. Um, if we look at um, Lakota funds in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Hmm. Um, they're about a $12 million organization. So assets are really going to be contingent on where they're able to get their funding. Some tribes are lucky enough that they have excess revenue that they can invest within these organizations. Mm -hmm. Some tribes do not have that money, so it's really contingent upon how well you can get foundations, how, how well you can get investors, mm -hmm. how well you're able to get um, federal granting dollars to help with that aspect. Mm. So I would say um, generally we're looking at around a hundred thousand dollar organization up to about a 20 million mm. it's really it's really dependent on location and what the market is sure uh, my last question is really if you could paint a picture of what the impact has been um, on the lives for on of native people in terms of um, the different kinds of financial products that they've been able to access and how that's shifted shaped mm -hmm. or, or changed um, their, their daily life? Mm -hmm. So I would say one of the, the biggest changes that we've seen within our communities is the advent of financial literacy and what that means on how um, our people are really looking at, at money and economies in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, within the financial literacy curriculum that is um, a prere prerequisite for any type of loan that you're going to get, we indicate short-term and long-term savings goals. One of the classes that I was teaching on my home reservation, um, I had an elder that was participating in the class. And when I was asking her what her short-term or long-term savings goal would be, she got very upset and she indicated that I was asking her to be individualistic and that that is not how our people have survived for 500 years. So who am I to come in and start talking about money and you need to save money, you need to start putting money in a bank. Mm. I had to really change and, and a lot of our, our practitioners and, and CDFI leaders throughout the country who are providing this type of education, we realize on a cultural level that we look at money differently. We look at assets differently. So in that measure, um, I gave an example. Recently, she had a death in her family, um, and she had to go to predatory lending institutions to borrow funds to bring family members back home on a bus so they could attend their funeral. Mm -hmm. In that juncture, I indicated if you had had a savings account, you wouldn't be paying $3,000 more in interest mm -hmm. than you would on this $2,000 loan. You could help more. So in the ability to really change people's mindsets and what it means to collect assets is mm -hmm. different within um, Native communities in and of itself based on the scarcity, the location, and our huge cultural differences that we have and we've been so fortunate to um, retain for mm -hmm. generation upon generation. So I would say really the um, the greatest aspect that we've seen aside the from the promotion of private sector development is people really being able to take control of their personal finances and have their own personal financial freedom for whatever that means to themselves um, in their lives to their families and that has been phenomenal throughout Indian country. That's great.
Well, Crystal Cornelius, thank you so much for taking time uh, to, to share some words about the work yes, that you do. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.